Okay, um, it looks like we are sort of settling down in the, the numbers of participants joining. So we'll, we'll kick off now in the interest of trying to keep everything to time. Good afternoon, uh, my name's Ariana Kelly and I'm joined by my, my colleagues, Eliza Sharon, Sophie Allen, Ashton Campbell and Sophie Hurst to talk about the DP and Hillingdon case uh, because it is a case that's causing so much consternation. We decided we definitely needed at least five of us to come in and try to address all of the different issues of it. Ashing and Sophie are gonna kick off with a summary of what the case was about. And then we're gonna go into a discussion of some of the practical issues such as the scope of section 21A applications, how declarations and recitals should be made and the extension of standard authorizations when a section 21A application is pending. So with that, I'm gonna hand over to Ashling. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Ashling. I volunteered to do the summary of the case for this part of the talk and I must say as I delved a little deeper into the judgment I did have some regrets uh, but hopefully I'll be able to make it clear for you it, it, nice and quickly. Um, so this is a decision of Mr Justice Hayden following a hearing on the 29th and 30th of July of this year but he handed his decision down on the 28th of September essentially it involved an application for permission to appeal and then the appeal itself. The first instance decision was heard by or made by a deputy district judge. The case itself is a section 21A challenge to a standard authorisation. Ultimately, um, Mr Justice Hayden decided that permission to appeal was granted and he allowed the appeal. And just as a summary um, or structure of the summary to follow, I'm going to talk a bit about P, a bit about the decision at first instance, and then a bit about the decision on appeal. And Sophie's going to talk about the obiter comments about section 48. Uh, so P in this case, DP, was 72. He has a diagnosis of organic personality disorder and associated catatonic disorder, secondary to a couple of strokes. He'd been a resident in a care home since summer of 2004, so about 16 years by the time we got to this hearing. He had assistance with personal care, hygiene, medication, mobility, nutrition, general safety, and that was usually provided on a one-to-one -one basis, except for during his catatonic episodes when his needs increased and he had two-to-one support, and that was about every two weeks. So turning to the decision at first instance, the deputy district judge essentially made interim declarations under section 48 of the act that DP lacked capacity to make decisions regarding his care and residence. And as a result of that, she also called for a report under section 49 to deal with evidence on capacity and best interests. Uh, when reaching the decision to make the declarations, the deputy district judge analysed the capacity evidence in the Dolls Form 4 in quite a lot of detail, more so than we might ordinarily see. And she made a few criticisms of the assessment. Uh, in particular, she commented that the Section 12 assessor hadn't explained what his credentials were, aside from just saying he was a Section 12 assessor. He hadn't explained to DP what the purpose of the visit was, um, she also described his reasoning at times as being unclear or demonstrating poor connections or not quite making sense. And finally, she pointed out that um, sometimes the context of DP's responses weren't clear because we didn't know the questions that had been asked to elicit the answers that were recorded. In spite of that criticism, the deputy district judge concluded that the assessment did meet the statutory test for section 48 declarations to be made, i.e. she felt there was reason to believe that DP lacked capacity. In doing so, she probably relied upon the fact that the assessor may not have written down the best account of what he saw in interview and that um, she said DP not knowing the purpose of the assessment was unlikely to have materially impacted upon the assessment itself. Having said that, she wasn't satisfied that final declarations could be made and that explains why she um, called for a report under section 49. That then brings us to the appeal before Mr Justice Hayden. The appeal was brought on DP's behalf and four grounds of appeal were advanced. One, that the judge had failed to, wrongly failed to terminate the standard authorization. Two, that she had wrongly approached the question of whether to make a declaration of incapacity as a best interest decision. Three, that the order she had made was in breach of article 5.4 and four, that the order was in breach of article 8. Um, our talk today and the judgment itself focuses on the first two grounds of appeal. 
So if we turn first to ground one that relates to whether the judge wrongly failed to terminate the signed authorisation or not, the parties essentially agreed on a number of matters. They agreed, first of all, that the deputy district judge hadn't considered whether the standard authorisation could or should be terminated on the evidence before her. The parties also agreed that Article 5.4 requires the court to determine Section 21A applications as a matter of urgency. They also agreed that Section 48 itself doesn't permit the making of interim declarations. Um, so the reason to the the reason to believe that PLAC's capacity shouldn't be expressed in declaratory terms, and we'll go on to discuss ways in which it should be expressed within an order. Then DP's representatives argued two things in the alternative. First, that the court should never make interim orders in Section 21A applications because either the criteria are met or they aren't, and therefore there can be no interim remedy because the only remedies available are termination or variation. Second, in the alternative, they argued that an interim order to give further information should only be made if there's sufficiently clear evidential basis to do so. Uh, Mr Justice Hayden rejected the first argument of those two and favoured the second. He decided that the court's function in the Section 21A application is to determine the questions of whether the qualifying requirements are met and then to go on to consider whether to vary or terminate the standard authorisation in light of its determination of those questions. He emphasised that the only function of the court is one of review and that the court doesn't become responsible for authorising peace deprivation of liberty. Again, we'll go on to discuss what that might mean in practice. Because of that, he then went on to say that he granted the appeal on the basis of ground two. So ground two was the fact that the judge had conflated the best interest decision with the decision to um, make a section 48 declaration that there was reason to believe that P lacked capacity. There isn't a lot of information or a lot of discussion about this point within the judgment because the parties actually agreed ahead of the appeal that the Section 48 declaration had been made in a way that conflated it with the best interest decision. We don't know very much about that just from reading this appeal decision. Um, something we've discussed as a team is what the remedy there, if therefore is, for the applicant in this case, or the appellant. We know that an appeal is brought against an order and not merely the reason for an order when there's no issue with the order itself. So by extension, we must be assuming that Mr Justice Hayden was accepting that the deputy district judge's order was wrong. It can't be the case that he just thinks it was fine for her to make section 48 declarations, but the reason for her doing so wasn't right. So what we've decided amongst us as a team is that we think probably the decision he was making was that the section 48 declaration never should have been a section 48 declaration it should have been a case of either reciting or, or um, in other ways specifying that there's the threshold was met and there was a reason to believe that P lacked capacity as opposed to it being in declaratory form and we reached the view that that was probably the case because if Mr Justice Hayden were to decide that in fact the judge was wrong to find that DP um, or there was reasons to believe that DP may lack capacity, then it's very difficult to see why he wouldn't then go on to also terminate the standard authorisation, because that would be on the basis that the eligibility requirement for capacity hadn't been met. Um, so that summarises the grounds and the reason why the appeal was ultimately allowed, although it's clear that probably it was allowed in theory, but the practical reality wasn't quite there. Sophie is now going to cover the obiter observations that Mr Justice Hayden made about section 48. Hi all, yes, I'm going to be looking at the obiter comments made by uh, Mr Justice Hayden in this decision. Um, interestingly, these weren't comments he had to make, um, given that all parties were in agreement on the purpose of uh, section 48 in this case. But nevertheless, he went on to make some um, pretty important point in relation to this and he took the opportunity here to clarify the circumstances under which it's appropriate for the court to proceed on the basis of the interim jurisdiction um, granted under section 48. Um, in doing this he ran through some decisions which had um, discussed this very matter previously 
First of all, he looked at the case of uh, Rief and the decision of Her Honour Judge Marshall. Uh, in this case, um, Her Honour Judge Marshall found the threshold for using Section 48 was that there must be sufficient evidence to justify a reasonable belief that P may lack capacity uh, in the relevant regard. And I think it's, it's quite well understood that this set the threshold, the bar, uh, quite low uh, for the use of Section 48. Now, this decision of Honour Judge Marshall was something that Mr Justice, Mr. Justice Hayden had grappled with uh, and disagreed with on a previous occasion um, in the case of Wandsworth. And in this case, he drew a distinction between Section 15 and Section 48, but said that while Section 15 was a different test with different interim objectives, it didn't mean it was a lesser one. Basically, he was saying that the threshold as described by Honour Judge Marshall uh, was too low. And he said um, that the, the basis of Section 48 had to be on a solid and well-reasoned assessment of uh, P's capacity. In DP, the DP case, uh, Mr. Justice Hayden then, Mr. Justice Hayden then went on to look at the decision in DA versus DJ and the decision, decision of uh, Mrs. Justice Parker. And in this case, uh, Mrs. Justice Parker looked at the decision of Her Honour Judge Marshall and Mr. Justice Hayden in, in Wandsworth, where he sort of pushed that threshold up. And she basically pulled it back down again. And she preferred uh, the, the, the reasoning of Her Honour Judge Marshall and, and found that that lower threshold was in fact the one that should be uh, used when determining whether the interim jurisdiction to section 48 uh, should be used. Uh, she said that the question to be asked was in fact, is there reason to believe uh, that P lacks uh, capacity? And in coming to that uh, decision, it's appropriate to look at all, all the information that's before the court, and that could be hearsay evidence uh, alone, um, which in fact was the case, I believe, in DA versus DG. She had four witness statements of, of siblings in that case, and that, that was all she had. There was no assessment of capacity, and that was enough. It's taking a, a holistic view of all the information to come before the court at that time and asking, uh, is there reason to believe that P lacks capacity? And in this case of, of DP, uh, Mr. Justice Hayden basically he reflects on his decision in Wandsworth and looks back and he ultimately agrees uh, with the decision of, of Mrs. Justice Parker and he too says that the question for the court remains throughout is there reason to believe that P lacks capacity and that that in fact is the correct threshold uh, to be looking at. He says in his summary at paragraph 62 of the DP judgment that the words of the statute in section 48 require no gloss. It is just that question that needs to be asked. Um, interestingly, however, and I know this is something I've discussed with, with Ariana, and it may be an appropriate point for her to, to jump back in maybe um, and open the discussion a bit more widely, is that whilst he sort of suggests in the judgment he agrees with Mrs. Justice Parker completely, in DA versus DG, as I've said, there was that point where actually there was no assessment before the court. It was all based on hearsay evidence. And ultimately she found that was enough. Whereas at paragraph 62, at 61 in the DP judgment, Hayden does sort of re-emphasize the need for a slightly higher threshold than that. He, he, he says, you know, a failure to inform P as to what an assessment is actually addressing will probably uh, be fatal to, or at least gravely undermine, the reliability of any conclusion. Um, so I think there is something in DA and DG that he doesn't, DJ, that he doesn't quite grapple with there. Um, but, but his ultimate uh, conclusion is that the, the question to be asked for Section 48 is, is there reason to believe P lacks capacity? And that that higher threshold he previously pushed in Wandsworth perhaps isn't the one, uh, isn't the one to take. Uh, when discussing interim, um, the jurisdiction of the interim um, under Section 48. Um, I don't know whether Ariana wants to add any more on that particular point. Well, about uh, and I, clash. <laughs> well, and, and I think one of the, the points that I, I find very interesting in this judgment is that, uh, as we were discussing before we, we came on, that I've always thought that one of the fundamental reasons we have interim declarations or have had up until uh, this judgment has come down 
is that the assessments which underlie standard authorizations are often very poor in quality. Uh, certainly not all, some of them are excellent. I, I think we've all seen examples that have right, gone the full gamut from assessments that don't say the right person's name that have clearly been copied and paid from another assessment that refer to P as a, a man rather than a woman, which give the wrong diagnosis. I've seen all of those in different examples that I've had at various points in time. And I think one of the reasons to my mind that the interim declarations have often been useful is that they do get to that question of, is there enough before the court to say that P should remain detained for the pendency of the Section 21A application, which may take weeks or in many cases, months to make a determination. And as Ms. Justice Hayden points out in DP, this is a very serious burden on the person's liberty to simply remain detained in the meantime. And while I think everyone would certainly accept his point that a standard authorization does provide a lawful means of authorizing a deprivation of liberty, the fact that a standard authorization is granted does not necessarily mean that the deprivation of liberty is in fact lawful. There are many examples in court protection case law, probably most notably the Neary case, where standard authorizations, in fact, in Neary three standard authorizations were granted, none of which the court later found was a lawful, depri a lawful deprivation of liberty because the assessments had been of poor quality. They had failed to engage with the right questions. And so to my mind, that was the purpose of the interim declarations was to have the court take an initial look at the evidence and say whether or not there was enough there for the person to continue to be held or whether the section 21H should essentially just be determined on its face at that moment in time. Now, one of the questions which I think this also raises and something Sophie's mentioned in one of the earlier cases is this line of what a Section 21A application really is. And is a Section 21A application a simple determination of whether a standard authorization was actually granted or does it have a wider scope on that? And I think Eliza has had probably more developed thoughts on that certainly than I have and may be able to enlighten us. So one of the things that's interesting about this judgment is at first blush, it seems to suggest that a Section 21A application should be limited to reviewing whether the qualifying requirements are met. And I think it's important to note that as a point of principle, this makes sense in terms of the practice that we've all had for some time now, in terms of what a final Section 21A order looks like, which is simply determining whether the qualifying requirements of best interest and capacity are met, rather than making the broader declarations as to capacity regarding residence and care that we have tended to on an interim basis, probably just as a hangover from um, previous ways of practicing. So in many ways, the judgment does tie in with that um, element of practice. But what I think it does leave um, unresolved is the extent to which Section 21A applications can be used as a gateway to broader best interest decisions. Um, which may require interim orders, not just in respect of case management, but on other best interest points. And I think it's worth noting that the applicant in this case did uh, apply for a very narrow construction of what 21A applications should entail. And that was rejected by Mr Justice Hayden, um, who made the point that while there may not usually be a need for Section 48 orders in Section 21 applications, Section 21A applications, there may be cases where Section um, 48 orders are required, where there is a clear evidential basis to do so. And he makes that point very clearly at paragraph 39, although he doesn't really go on to expand in any great detail what those sort of circumstances may be. But of course, we all know from practice that whilst you have very standard Section 21A proceedings where there aren't the need for other types of interim best interest orders. Very often there are ancillary issues that do arise in relation to contact, for example, uh, internet use, moving from one care home to another, which may require an interim authorization of a transition plan, for example. Uh, and uh, what's not clear is the extent to which Mr. Justice Hayden is saying those issues can no longer be dealt with under section 21A. I would query whether it really is the case that we now start need to start need to issuing welfare applications for all those sorts of ancillary issues. And I would suggest those sorts of points probably come under that category of where Section 48 orders are appropriate, where there's a clear evidential basis for them. And of course, this judgment shouldn't just be read in isolation. It needs to be read 
in conjunction with other first instance or appellate decisions that go to the same points. And I think it's worth referring back to the Mr. Justice Baker decision of CC and KK from back in 2012, where he made the point very plainly that once an application is made to the court under section 21A, the court's powers are not confined simply to determining that question. Once its jurisdiction is invoked, the court has a discretionary power under section 15 to make declarations as to a person's capacity. And then going on to note that where P lacks capacity, the court has wide powers under section 16 to make decisions on behalf of P. So that judgment remains good law and the judgment of DP doesn't really go into that issue in any significant way. And I think it's also important to note that the Court of Appeal judgment in the Briggs matter really appears to affirm that position from CC and KK. And it's noted at 84 um, by the Court of Appeal that Miss Richards, understandably in argument, relied heavily on the fact that the court can, on an application under section 21A, Make, the orders under make orders under section 16 of the Act. So that is a decision at Court of Appeal level, which appears to confirm that once a section 21A application is before the court, the gateway is open to the section 16 um, powers. And now just linking in with this, it isn't clear what the judgment is saying in respect of whether interim declarations may be made in welfare cases and of course, people may have noted the fact that rule 10.1 of the Court of Protection Rules specifically makes provision for interim declarations to be made as an interim remedy. <clears throat> and so I would query whether the point is that interim declarations may be made in welfare cases, in which case, if the court is required to exercise interim jurisdiction regarding those best interest points, it may be appropriate to make capacity declarations on those issues. And I think Sophie Allen is going to pick up on that point. Thanks, Eliza. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so we were talking in practical terms before we started about what issues were actually coming up on a day-to-day -day basis in practice. Um, and one thing which seems to be coming up perhaps more than anything else is the question of whether um, following DP, you can still make um, interim declarations on Section 21A proceedings or otherwise. And, and I apologise for taking you all back to um, the DP case when, when Ashling's already covered it, but of course in, in the Hillingdon case, all parties and all council um, agreed uh, that section 48 uh, doesn't give the court the power to make declarations. And that set out, um, uh, as has been mentioned in paragraph 40. And paragraph 40 says, um, all council agree that an application made pursuant to section 21A does not permit the making of interim declaration pursuant to section 48. Indeed, they submit that section 48 itself does not permit the making of interim declarations, notwithstanding that this is um, almost universally the practice. Uh, as set out at paragraph 29, section 48 provides for the making of an order for the giving of directions, which is correct. It does not provide for the making of um, a, decla a declaration, thus the court's finding that there is reason to believe that P lacks capacity or strictly not to be uh, phrased in declaratory terms. And the judge goes on to uh, discuss the different approaches or the preferred approach of um, Victoria Butler Cole QC and considers her initial approach to be too narrow, but then doesn't really um, go on to provide an answer to the question of, of whether interim declarations um, can be made, but certainly the initial reading of it would it would appear if you take a strict interpretation of 48 um, that 48 doesn't allow the court to make declarations um, uh, only orders or directions. Now that, as Eliza has already pointed out, presents a number of uh, difficulties, um, and I think one immediate difficulty which we we're discussing, and certainly uh, uh, Eliza has been ventilating is how um, a court deals with the issue of capacity to conduct um, proceedings for the purpose of, for example, appointing litigation friend. And um, there isn't an answer to that. Um, secondly, as Eliza just mentioned, a broader, a, broader, a broader problem with that interpretation is 10.10, .10, which provides in the, uh, the Court of Protection Rules, which, which provides an explicit power um, for the court 
uh, to make an interim declaration. Now, as far as I can see, 10.10, um, the issue of 10.10 wasn't addressed at all and wasn't argued at all before the court in ReDP and certainly wasn't referred to um, in the judgment. And so what's the answer? Well, Reveille, I don't think there's, a, there's, a, there's an easy answer to it. Um, I think to the extent that um, DP appears to say that you can't make interim declarations, I think you can limit that um, if you're going to follow that uh, to section 21A only. Um, as has been mentioned, um, section 16 applications are not touched upon. Um, secondly, I suppose, uh, to, as, a, as a protectionist measure, if you're concerned about the, the jurisdictional authority to make um, declarations, it's quite feasible, to, I'm sure everyone who, who, all of you who are, are, are here at this seminar um, are aware, it's quite feasible to uh, simply address the issue but not do it in declaratory terms. So, for example, um, I think a turn of phrase that I've been, been seeing used, which seems to, to do the job, is upon the court pursuant to section 48, having reason to believe and then making recordings as the capacity and then making orders pursuant to section 48 about residence um, with a reference to that residence being um, lawful and in P's best interests. Uh, I mean, as far as I can see, that does the job, but I don't think there's a there's a clear answer in the case. I don't, I don't know if anyone else has had any, um, any clearer thoughts than mine in the time that we've been having this discussion. I think it's worth um, reiterating the point that all parties in that case agreed that you couldn't make declaratory relief under Section 48. And so firstly, the point wasn't argued, um, but it really leaves open what is the purpose of Rule 10.10 .10 of the Court of Protection Rules, which makes it plain that an interim remedy available is interim declarations. And so I think that point does need to be further litigated, as, as you say, and probably within the context of a Section 16 welfare application. Well, and speaking of Section 16 welfare applications, we've just had a question in from Christine McFarland asking a very good point of how will this work with the common practice of Section 16 proceedings being reconstituted as Section 21A proceedings? I, I mean, I think this sort of gets to the heart of the issue is that they're not fully distinguishable from each other in many ways. And that in order to determine a Section 21A application, there has to be a view on P's best interest. There has to be a view on P's welfare as to whether or not that can be made. I mean, so... I mean, I don't know if you guys would view this differently, um, but I mean, I would take the view that the reconstitution of it, something we may now have to consider as to whether the two of them should sit alongside each other, but obviously that may create difficulties around legal aid for P being represented within those proceedings. I have to say that my usual practice when it comes to reconstituting is to put in provision that the application is deemed to include a challenge under Section 21A. So that those broader welfare issues are left open, particularly if that's the application that the local authority has made and paid the fee to make, so they're not excluded from running those points. And usually where they're running hand in hand with the Section 21A proceedings, the Legal Aid Agency doesn't take any issue with that. Um, and another point um, that we've been discussing earlier, and I think Sophie Hurst can pick up on as well, is the question around uh, varying and extending standard authorizations and the extent to which that may have been affected by this judgment. But yeah. Oh, that, sorry, Eliza, go on. Just to pick up on the recital's point, I do query what the utility in this whole exercise is of simply um, changing where we put the interim declarations and making mm. them recitals. It seems to be a less robust way of addressing the issue than the court actually having to apply their mind to whether the interim test is met. It seems really it's a for, issue of form rather than substance in terms of um, the implications for practice uh, and is P any better protected by a recital than a declaration? I suspect not. No. I, I suppose one way around that is the pursuant to section 48, which Sophie discussed, or at least it, it touches on that a bit because it shows the court having had to consider section 48, at least even if not putting it in declaratory terms. Um, but it, 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 it's certainly something to consider, as is, as, as Ariana has just pointed out, what implications this judgment has in terms of extending and whether the court has the power to extend the standard authorizations. Because paragraph 46 of the judgment um, says quite clearly the court does not become responsible for authorizing P's deprivation of liberty.
upon the issuing of a Section 21A application, the court's only function is to provide the review of the authorization, uh, which is in force. And reading that in the strictest sense, um, the fact that it says the court does not become responsible for authorizing it would suggest that the court should not be extending standard authorizations uh, in the way that they often do and that we often see in Section 21A applications. Um, interestingly, however, if you read just the paragraph before that in paragraph 45, it does say that when Section 21A proceedings are brought, the court's function is to determine questions as to whether the qualifying requirements are met and consider, importantly, varying or terminating the authorization. So the fact it even puts in that the court should consi can consider varying the authorization suggests that there is the power there to extend that standard authorization. Um, and I know this was some, this is something that I've been asked about a number of times since this judgment came out and we were discussing about whether this judgment is actually saying the court shouldn't be doing that or whether in fact it's better to read it as more the court is discouraging um, the act of uh, extending the standard authorization uh, for local authorities in this cases and and I think you know we've, we've had quite a bit of discussion about this and I think we've decided that the judgment doesn't preclude a court extending the standard authorization it can still do that but there certainly seems to be a discouragement of such such an act in that paragraph 46 and what that's saying um, and I know that's an issue that as I say has been brought up a number of times um, with, with myself on, on section 23 applications since uh, this judgment came out. I'm cognizant we'd promised that this would be a short seminar and we have had a couple of actually very good questions. Um, so I'm trying, uh, hopefully we can try to get through a couple of these. Um, one question from Simon Robinson, how will DP impact on situations where proceedings have to be brought on an emergency basis where it's unclear if P has an impairment as they refuse to engage with clinicians, but there's other evidence of this and linked uh, and the linked lack of capacity. Now, I think this is something, Sophie, you were touching on a bit in your discussion around section 48 declarations. Would you like to pick that one up? Uh, yeah, so it's, it seems to be that it, certainly what Mrs. Justice Parker was saying in the uh, DA versus DJ decision was that sort of hearsay evidence, if you like, can be used. And I think Mr. Ju uh, Mr. Justice Hayden, in fact, says that in his uh, in, in DP as well, that when it comes to sort of these emergency applications, and I think it's something that's also touched on in the judgment itself, this, this idea of an emergency urgent cases. Um, you know, it, it, the jurisdiction, the section 48 is something that, that, that should be used. That's what it's there for. Um, so I think in those circumstances, certainly using the other evidence that, that, that you're talking about, Simon, is something that the court can do, especially in sort of these urgent emergency situations. Um, and I think that's something that, that Mr. Hayden does agree with in his judgment um, as well. Another question, uh, actually, maybe if Eliza might want to pick this one up uh, from Lauren, Lorna Warrender. Uh, if you have a Section 21A with ancillary de decisions being made, would we need a further welfare application and would legal aid follow the person? So we could be in the position of having two parallel proceedings and perhaps a broader question, is that really the best use of COP time? Well, my view, based on what I was outlining earlier, is I don't think there is a need for a discrete Section 16 welfare application to deal with ancillary welfare points that may arise in the course of the section 21A. Uh, and that goes back to the CC and KK and Briggs judgment that I was taking you through before. Of course, Briggs makes it very clear that section 21A shouldn't be used as a vehicle for what are really welfare issues like SMT issues. Um, but I, I think that format of having a welfare application where a section 21A challenge is deemed to be included or simply those minor issues are dealt with alongside can still continue to be the practice based upon DP or there's nothing to overturn that practice. I agree it wouldn't be cop time or parallel <laughs> applications. Um, another question we've had is discussion is focused on declarations regarding capacity. Section 15 provides also for declarations regarding lawfulness of any act done or to be done in relation to P. What is the status of declarations in relation to lawfulness? I'm just wondering, did, would anyone like to pick that up? Uh, well, I think this goes back to the point that the judgment is dealing with Section 21A applications, where those sorts of six, Section 15 declarations are not routinely made. And the point hasn't been argued about whether interim declarations are appropriate in welfare applications. And I think that is an area where there does need to be further litigation. 
Um, because certainly it's not the view across the board that section 48 prohibits any interim declarations being made, which is inconsistent with rule, um, COP rule 10.10. .10. And I think that's a very good example of where you may need an interim declaration for acts yet to be done under section 15. Well, and I think to be honest, I, this is one of the, the points we were discussing that I, I was at least ranting about earlier. Um, but I, I do think it's actually a really interesting one because I mean, to my mind, standard authorizations are inherently a time limited instrument. And I think sometimes you do find uh, situations in which there may be very broad agreement that P should be moving on from the place where they're living, care home, the nursing home as soon as possible. But in the immediate interim for the next few weeks, few months, while an alternative placement is found, while alternative arrangements are being made, the standard authorization actually is appropriate because when you look at it, while P should have better options before them, right now, there is nothing else there. And, and I think this sort of, the lawfulness point, I think often falls by the wayside in COP proceedings, which tend to be much more prospective looking rather than looking at how P got into the situation in the first place. But I, I think this is a really good point because I, I think one of the things to my mind that interim declarations have historically done was held that position of saying, while we all agree, perhaps the P should be moving on from where they are, right now this is the best option and we are agreeing essentially that this is lawful in the immediate present while that happens um it's now 5 39 and we had uh, promised i think this would be a half an hour seminar so perhaps maybe we take this as a last question there's a lot of coded language in this and various other decisions in recent times is it stating section 21a is a streamlined process and thus if the assessments are poor that is not up to judges correcting assessments but judging them Ashley, you, you, you kicked us off with this. Would you, would you like to pick that one up? I think actually Mr. Justice Hayden is rejecting that idea that if things are poor, you just terminate the standard authorization without doing any further inquiries. I think that was the sort of strict or rigid approach that Ms. Butler Cole QC was asking him to consider as her first alternative out of the two. Um, I appreciate there is some coded language. And um, I think the reality is going to be that it needs to happen quickly. It must be speedy access to justice. It must be a speedy review under Article 5.4. Of course, Mrs Justice Hayden in this decision doesn't explicitly address grounds three and four of appeal that relate to 5.4 and eight of the ECHR. But I think he's rejecting this idea that the proceedings should be so streamlined that we just make a snap decision there and then on the evidence available. And instead he's saying, let's see if the evidential threshold is met to go and seek some more information about what's going on here and then the court can determine whether something should be varied or terminated. Possibly, I, I can't imagine a case in my experience where this would be the case, but there must be some cases that come before the court in a section 21A where the standard authorization is so poor that there and then the court could make the decision to vary or terminate. But I think the most common practice is going to be that a judge says, well, hang on a minute, let's get a section 49 report or let's find out some of the best interest evidence for available options and goes from there. I don't think it's going to cut the process any shorter than it was before DP. I will just stand up solely on the basis that I have seen that happen a couple of times. I agree incredibly rarely, but there have been some where they were so manifestly appalling that the judge did feel quite confident in making a decision then and there. Um, I think that was our last question that had come in. It was any final thoughts from anyone on the panel? Can I just pick up on that last point? Because I think it ties in with what is an important point about the discouragement um, in terms of extending the standard authorization. Because, of course, when the court does extend it, the public bodies are excluded from liability for that period. And the court is then effectively holding the ring, which I think was the term that dates back to re-UF. And so by the court taking a more passive approach, uh, simply reviewing the lawfulness of the authorizations rather than taking them over, that is the court judging the decisions and not becoming responsible for correcting them. So I think that is an important practice point. And whilst there may be legitimate reasons, say for short periods where an extension may be required, I think this should give practitioners pause for thought in terms of routinely extending the standard authorization with the court essentially taking over the role of the supervisory body. Um, and that does make sense when you stand back and look at the overall framework. Well, on that note, thank you all so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to uh, discuss this very interesting case, which I'm sure we'll have follow up litigation in the months and years to come, which we can go and puzzle over a bit more. So thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you.